Um, my name is Brenton Caffin. Uh, welcome to day three of the States of Change Learning Festival uh, and the session we've got now, Governance Innovation in a Crisis, Victorian Experience. Um, before we begin, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the lands that we're, that we're meeting from. Uh, I'm joining you today from the traditional lands of the Paramang people uh, in the Adelaide Hills. Um, wherever you are, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, particularly, particularly in this week, National Reconciliation Week, and on this day, uh, Mabo Day, the uh, um, anniversary of the decision in the High Court. Um, we are going to uh, bring up Chris very shortly, um, if you haven't already. Um, so this, this session is all about um, a case study, if you like, um, and this, the format we're going to use for this is um, very much a, an on-the-couch session. Um, in fact, when I spoke to Chris last week, he admitted he hadn't had much time to really process uh, the ramifications of, of this crazy time that we've been going through. So um, when we, just, when we uh, originally designed this as an on-the-couch session, we didn't realise it was going to be that kind of couch. Um, but uh, we hope you uh, enjoy this conversation. Um, feel free to um, put comments into the chat. We do have a Q&A function. Um, so if there's a particular question you'd like to bring into the mix, um, uh, just feel free to put it in there. You can upvote questions just by giving it a thumbs up. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm sure for our Australian audience, um, they probably don't need an introduction to Chris, um, particularly those of you joining from Melbourne. Um, but for our international audience, uh, just to give you a very brief introduction to Chris. Uh, Chris is the Secretary of the Victorian Department of the Premier and Cabinet, um, which is if you like, the, uh, the leading uh, department in the state government uh, in each country, in each state of Australia. Um, Chris has actually held that role in several state governments across Australia over the last decade or so, and so therefore has a very unique vantage point uh, on the role of both state governments, as well as also the um, uh, relationship between the Commonwealth and state uh, jurisdictions. So um, welcome, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, Let's, let's, let's ease our way into this. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm great. Um, I, I suppose I'm, I'm better than I was two months ago, um, where, and we can probably touch on uh, the, the intensity of effort in the days where we first were responding to the fact of the crisis. It's now moved into a bit more of a rhythm. And as a, as a, a person who is, um, comfortable with routine but the routine now is one that where there's a, a cadence and a rhythm now to it that we had to perhaps invent I mean it wasn't there when we first you know got immersed in this extraordinary extraordinary event and I get to wear a hoodie to work so I mean <laughs> there are, the, the prospect of having to go back to um, going back to conventional public service attire is entirely daunting. In fact, just I just came from meeting with the Premier at Parliament House and I'd forgotten I was meeting with him, Parliament sitting, and I turned up in a hoodie and jeans and boots. And it's a mark of the fact of how we have changed in the last three months that he did not bat an eyelid. It was yeah. entirely yeah, that, that sort of stuff. All yeah, right, that's back. It's been really, it's a moment to sort of show up as, as, as humans first, um, you know, yeah. together with cats and kids and hoodies and, yeah. yeah. I don't, we'll, we'll touch on this. I just, I just don't think, and I know that's the most frivolous of, of um, manifestations of change and we'll get to the, the deeper stuff. But, you know, there's something in this as well. Um, there is something in the way we present ourselves and what becomes important and what isn't important as public servants. And to be honest, our attire is one of the least important things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, I might just encourage a little bit of um, crowd participation, um, just maybe so that um, Chris has an idea as well as myself, like where people are joining from. If you feel, we just want to sort of quick shout out in the chat, like where in the world you're joining from. Uh, we'll see how domestic or how international an audience we've got, um, and we'll we'll keep talking. But feel free to to, to check in, say where you where you're dialing in from, and and we'll know whether we have to um, 
explain lots of different uh, acronyms. Uh, because there, was, there was a lot of interest. Yep. We've got a lot of interest in this uh, a few weeks ago in the uh, How, Not, How Not to Waste a Crisis series, uh, Chris. Yeah. Um, when Sam mentioned some of the innovations that you were putting in governance, there was a lot of people um, very, yeah. very keen to sort of hear um, a bit more about it. Um, so this is, it was actually partly the prompt. Yeah, that I've moved on in my, in my rhetoric from how not to waste a crisis to how not to squander a wave of public confidence and trust in government. Yeah, well, which is, which is in a way, this is the whole purpose of this festival. How do we actually capture the, the, you know, the good in this moment of crisis and make sure that we you know, continue to build on this muscle memory? Um, yeah. so, maybe, um, so maybe for the international uh, audience, although I can see so many people from Melbourne, <laughs> so <laughs> hello to everyone from Melbourne, um, but for those who are um, overseas and just need a little bit more of context, maybe you could just talk a little bit about, um, I guess, the Victorian government context uh, and maybe just a little bit about um, the sort of how the COVID crisis um, manifested itself um, in, in your neck of the woods. Yeah. So, um for those of those who are participating from from overseas, uh, Victoria is one of the one of eight states and territories in the federation. Uh, we're the the second largest of of the states. I would like to I would like to argue that we're the we're the most progressive. But I'm sure there are people around this call who will instantly challenge me through the chat around that. Um, and. Uh, so a, a, a highly functioning federation, which it, it, and its genius has been revealed through the crisis in a way that perhaps some other federations around the world would be envious. And I can, again, come back to how we have coalesced as nine jurisdictions and the ability of the of genuinely of that old bromide of the, of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. And I think that is absolutely the fact of the experience of the Australian uh, Federation. Um, a bit like everyone, although I, I must say our context is unique. Victoria and Australia's context is unique in the run up to the, 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 um, the pandemic because we came out of, as many would recall, out of the most significant bushfires that have been seen in the history of this country. So rather than the, the COVID pandemic being the first of the, the crises that we were we were managing, and we we, we smoothly segued from, from the cross the crisis of of the bushfires into the crisis of the of the pandemic, and just parenthetically, I was uh, I, I have a house on the far south coast of New South Wales, and I was actually involved in fighting the bushfires, wow. and and protect, protecting my property. And then came back to came back to Melbourne, and then fairly quickly found ourselves in the grip of this this new the new crisis. And it was a bit it was really it was interesting. There was a it was a slow burn in one sense. There was a, a general awareness from late January about what was emerging in China, um, and we formed we formed in late January a um, an incident management team in our in our Department of Health. But it wasn't until, and February saw a series of, um, I guess the, the updated case definitions with testing expanded to an increasing number of arrivals from different countries. But to be honest, it only because I was um, a bit engaged in the Victorian response to the, the bushfire recovery at that point. Um, it really only came home to me in, in mid-February where we launched a campaign to support Victoria's Chinese community in a campaign called Stronger Together, uh, which was showing that there was a, some real stress on you know, our, our social cohesion through the, um, the misdirection of, um, you know, of issues towards our, our, our very strong um, uh, Victorian Chinese community. And I remember the 19th of February, it became really obvious to me that this was having a, a, a non-health impact on our, on our society. And then there was this funky time um, in, uh, in, in early March. And it really is 
perfectly strange that I was at the final of the women's T20 uh, World Cup on the 8th of March, and I was present with 83,000 others at the MCG. 83,000 people in close proximity on the 8th of March. And one week later, we have declared a state of emergency and we have moved to a, a vigorous response to, uh, to the emerging, emerging issues, public health issues associated with the pandemic. And in the course of that week, we released a pandemic plan, we activated our state control centre, we cancelled the form, first Formula One of the year, COAG met on the 13th, the National Cabinet was formed and met on the 15th, and on the 16th, we declared a state of emergency. So in the space of a week, you are encapsulating the book ended. The book end of the week is being mm -hmm. in the presence of 80,000 people at the MCG <laughs> to, to a state of emergency. To a state of emergency, which was based on the explicit prohibition of large gatherings. Yeah. And sorry, COAG, and COAG, you might just want to unpack for, um, uh, for our international guests. Yeah, and Britain will have to through the course of this because of the, my lazy regard for acronym. Um, he'll call me out. So the Council of Australian... <laughs> so that's where um, periodically all of the sovereign governments of Australia, the nine, meet and they discuss various matters. Uh, and on this occasion, it was dominated by uh, the issue of the, of the pandemic. And that was on, on the Friday. And from that was formed a unique, uh, a unique entity, which has since become the successor to COAG called the National Cabinet. Mm -hmm. same, uh, same constituent parts, but very different purpose, very different rhythm of meeting um, and very different set of outcomes. Yeah, because traditionally, and again, for, for our internationals, COAG would, would meet at the head of government level twice a year, maybe? Yeah, twice a year. Once, yeah. Yeah, twice a year, and, and instead of twice a week over these last few months. Um, well, and... 20th. We just had the 20th National Cabinet meeting last week. Since, since the middle of March. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, that, that, that relationship has had in the past often been characterised as... Um, difficult, if not antagonistic, because in a way, again, this is just a little bit of background for our internationals, a lot of our taxation powers are at the federal level, a lot of the sort of spend um, in sort of social, you know, health and social care is actually done at the state level. So often these, these conversations are quite fraught because often the purse strings are being held at, the, at a different level of government from where the services are, are being spent. And also quite um, ritualistic. It, it's, yeah. it's like, a, like a, a very stately minuet where everyone knows their part in the dance. And it, and it's part of the critique of the old, which has now been replaced with the new, that it was, it was, I mean, some would say sclerotic, others would say formulaic. I think that's being a bit harsh to the, to the institution, but it was not fit for the purpose of, of the instant responses required to the ever-changing dynamic of the, uh, of the pandemic. Similarly, at the state level, our, our and I'm, I have no doubt we'll, we'll get to that, that it became very apparent that the way we are organised, we were organised as a government at the state level was insufficient to deal with the, the speed of decision making that was required in the months, um, in the months following the declaration of the state of emergency. Um, so do you want to maybe just talk a little bit more, well, give us some examples of, of you know, what some of those decisions, um, you know, what, what's, what some of them were, um, what had to be mobilised quickly? Um, yeah, I, I, I think the, the month of March uh, at a public health level saw a, um, commonly, with, in, in common with the rest of the world, more parts of the world. A progressive escalation of the restrictions. So it began with large gatherings and then moved through particular social activity and commercial activity that had people you know, more proximate than they, they could safely be, which culminated in 
the uh, the ultimate in the social control, which was the stage three restrictions. And having said that, where everything is compressed into dog years, that happened between the uh, the second week of March and the and the last week of March, so over a two week period, where we ended up with the the dominant social control, which were the restrictions requiring people to stay at home unless they they were they were absent or leaving home for the for food and supplies, medical care, exercise, and work and education. So not, yeah. I mean, a form. I mean, the the colloquial term was you know was I suppose was I suppose lockdown. So that was the that, that it was, was the tightest. The, it was the tightest in Australia, wasn't it? It was, wasn't as tight as New Zealand, but it was it was the tightest across Australia. I mean, that was commonly, yeah, indeed. Victoria took a took a position which has been characterised as the most conservative position, uh, but it was again based on based on the on the on the public health public health advice that we should um, we should seek to control um, control the movement of people and the the exercise of and the, the sorts of commercial activity that was appropriate to support people in their day-to-day -day life but not that was um, non-essential non-essential activity I mean and the impact I mean if you think about it the, the the impact of those sort of controls on service delivery if we as public you know service delivery practitioners public policy practitioners was was immediate impact was wholesale and it was it was profound so this the, the the school education system in victoria moved to remote and flexible learning totally um, non-urgent elective surgery was instantly suspended um, our emergency um, department presentations and admissions fell off a cliff um, and if you think about our justice and social services, whether it's whether it's courts, um, corrections, uh, youth justice, family violence, um, child protection, disability, housing, homelessness, drug and alcohol, they were all impacted by the imperative about the health and well-being of both the workforce and the clients. So there was an instant requirement for the public service to pivot to a form of service delivery that limited face-to-face -face contact with clients where possible. And boy, oh boy, talk about, you know, necessity and the mother of invention, um, the, the ability of the public service. And to be honest, the, 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 the sympathetic response from public service clients to the imperative of this new way of delivery was, I, I think, nothing short of short of magnificent. So there was some, there was some, uh, and we've done a little bit of a calculation about the number of service delivery innovations that have occurred almost organically and driven by the workforce, which is the coolest part. Uh, the service delivery innovations in response to this requirement to physically separate, there's over 150 at last count. And in yep. fact, that counts weeks ago. So there's, there's been this um, this amazing creativity on the part of service deliverers in being able to respond to the imperative about how yep. you deliver services remotely. Yeah. So that could I, one little thing. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, could could you maybe sort of just dig into that a little bit about how you captured that? Because we've we've been talking over the last couple of months about this idea of you know, deploying innovation teams alongside crisis response teams to capture that novel practice, because actually often yeah. people who are in the response are so busy manning the pumps that they don't notice the normal, you know, the novel practice. And then when things subside, they, they have that amnesia because they just get back to get back to business. Yeah. So what, how did you actually do that? How did you capture that? Yeah. And, and, and for this, it's, it's full credit to the, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the managers and the executive and the workforce themselves who were who were in the moment of um, you know the use of uh, audio visual links to hear a higher volume of court matters remotely um, the remote supervision of people who were subject 
to um, community-based orders, expanded telehealth options, all of those things. That's the instant response. Mm -hmm. And then there was, so, so how, as you say, Britain, how do you, how do you step back and make sense of that? And what, what was done was the creation of a framework for the systematic assessment of these service delivery um, innovations. And they very quickly applied that. And it's not, it's not, you know, it's not a, um, it's not, it's not a remarkable framework, but it's still the ability to apply it so quickly and then to activate it and operationalize it so that that framework included um, so and this will be familiar to folk who are reformers and innovators around around the call um, you you were you were you, you just get into the basics of assessing the benefits and risks of the service delivery approach and the user experience really critical then you the monitoring part which is to assess the effectiveness of the intervention with data as the, the key to that you then do an evaluation. So you are linking the evaluation of the delivery model as the delivery model is being, uh, is being rolled out. The simple, the simple fact of sharing good practice. So what you are doing is you are not assuming that the practice that you are engaged in that is delivering uh, a, an effective outcome is limited to your particular service. It probably has application more broadly and then embedding, entrenching the improvements in the day-to-day -day operations of delivery. Now, over a normal life cycle of reform, you would be applying that framework in, in some cases in years. Yeah, and, <laughs> <Not> in weeks. <laughs> well, in weeks, exactly. So the, the, whole, the, the whole idea about everything moving to a different cadence because of the speed with which we were being presented with the challenges of the, of the pandemic and the ability to assist those who are at the front line who are inventing the innovation and then being able to capture it and then being able to codify it and then being able to elaborate on it um, was pretty, I think, pretty impressive. Yeah. So the other um, part of... Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 go on, go on the other part, yep. Well, the, the, the other part is the, if you like, is the meta, um, the meta. So there was, there was the, the, the granular and absolutely critical part of service delivery, innovation and responsiveness. And then there was the meta structural and organisational changes to government. And yep. these are... Uh, profound a change to the structure of government as I have seen in my 300 years of practice <laughs> and um, I've been doing this since the tutor years so <laughs> I've been around well, let's, let's 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 unpack that because um, I mean uh, I know one of the things we wanted to talk about was this idea of the sort of we just we talked about a bifurcation you suggested maybe even a trifurcation of government decision making that while you're both dealing with the, the crisis response you're also having to set aside part of the government's brain for managing the recovery as well as kind of keeping the lights on so maybe you talk a little bit about how how you structured that yeah and it, it again that it, it came through uh, observed experience that I remember on the, so we declared the state of emergency on the 16th and we had a cabinet meeting on that Friday and the cabinet meeting for, we, we were observing physical distancing in the cabinet room. And we were at all at weird points of the compass <laughs> and as you would expect. And, uh, and then it just became we, sort of, uh, we realised that, the, the conventional form of, of decision making was just not going to be sufficient to enable us to support a rapid and effective response to, um, to, the, to the pandemic. Um, so what did we do? That 
Friday night, it became obvious that we needed to do something. And so on the Sunday afternoon before the first meeting of the National Cabinet, we pulled a bunch of folk together, including some of our friends from, the, from professional services who even flew down from Sydney for this purpose. I was able to call in some, call in some friendships. And we workshopped it. We just sat down and we should workshop what does the redesign of government look like to enable us to respond as effectively as possible to this, to this crisis. And so we spent a little bit of time while we were flying the plane as that old chestnut goes. We were building the plane as we were flying it through the course of the next week. And on the 3rd of April, so just over a week later, we stood up a new design of um, a new design of government, and the, the essence of it was to create eight missions, eight public service missions, and they were directed to. Uh, and, and the concept of mission, I think. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll step back a bit. What, 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 why, why mission? Um, apart from the fact that missions are cool, um, like. Mission Impossible, um, that wasn't quite the motivation. It was more that a mission gives you uh, a clarity of collective purpose. Uh, uh, it implies a coordinated effort. Uh, it implies the, the focused application of expertise and resources. It implies the rapid transition from design to decision to delivery. It implies that it's data driven and it supports the systems approach, which when you are dealing with the, the complexity, particularly the complexity of managing an economy and a society and a health system, a systems approach is... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's like, it's, it's, it's critical. So we established eight missions. Um, and I won't go through all of them. I'll, I'll briefly... You'll mention a few, just, yeah. There was the health emergency and economic emergency. So that went to the, the immediate response. So that was examining our fiscal position. Um, there was the business continuity in certain industry sectors, which are critical to the economy and the response efforts. So supply, logistics and procurement. Mm -hmm. Then... Two missions related to the continuity of essential services. One, people, so justice, education, social services, and the other economics. So the continuation of our electricity network, our communications, our transport network. And then recognising that you need to build for recovery at the same time as you are planning for the instant response. We had a mission around the economic recovery. And then... And then we had two missions around the restoration of public services, one related to people and one related to economic, which is to deal with the long, starting to think about what are the long run impacts and risks associated with what we are dealing with, but giving different people the headspace to plan for that so they're not having to plan for the immediate. And then what we did was we pulled the secretaries, so the secretaries of departments are the chief executives, We've got eight departments here in Victoria, so it's a small number of administrative uh, administrative uh, centres. We pulled the eight secretaries, so our top public service leaders, out of running their departments and made them each responsible for a mission, and in some cases jointly responsible. And they were directly accountable to the Premier who wrote to them with their charter letter for their mission directly accountable to the Premier for the execution of their mission. Now, in all of this, while they're focused on the mission, how do you run the departments of state? So for the business as usual, and I don't mean to diminish that role, business as usual in a COVID crisis is still like serious, serious business. We created a new, a, new, a new thing called an associate secretary. And the Associate Secretary took over the responsibility for the day-to-day -day administration of each department to allow our most senior public servants to focus on the delivery of the missions. 
And those missions, uh, in addition to their the secretary's account, direct accountability to the head of state or the premier, um, they also reported to a body that we created called the Crisis Council of Cabinet. And that was a new invention. It didn't exist prior to the 3rd April. And that Crisis Council, the, the, the normal, the cabinet in its normal operation has 22 ministers. The Crisis Council had eight. And each of those eight, um, eight ministers were sworn in with new portfolios. So there was a, a, a formal responsibility. It wasn't an, an informal commissioning. They went to the governor and they were formally appointed as ministers of the crown with responsibility for various of the responses across government. Never happened before. And parenthetically, um, ministers had ever been sworn in remotely, which we did with the governor. <laughs> The governor, appointed, the governor appointed them remotely, so there's innovation all over the map. And though that crisis council focused on all matters related to the emergency, including implementing the outcomes of the national cabinet. So it was set up to deal with our domestic response, but also dealing with the, uh, the positioning of the premier for the national cabinet and the implementation of matters that came out of the National Cabinet. So we've got missions, we've got the Crisis Council of Cabinet as the peak decision-making body. And then we created a, um, the, and this is probably getting a little bit, a bit technical, but I'll keep going there because there's an important point in it. A, I, I, think, um, I think this is the right audience for this, Chris. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so, we created a, a thing called the Missions Coordination Committee. And so the, the Crisis Council, uh, National Cabinet meets twice a week, Crisis Council of Cabinet meets twice a week. The Cabinet continues to meet to deal with the normal business of government, but the focus is on the response to the crisis. And a Mission Coordination Committee that I chaired and had all of the secretaries, so as in their capacity as responsible for the missions. But what was really interesting is that we also included within that, that committee for the first time, the senior staff, senior political staff. So the political staff from the Premier's private office and the Treasurer's private office were within the same decision-making forum. And it became the point where, because of the speed with which we were having to process information and submissions to go to the crisis council, like the speed was extraordinary. The efficiency of having the political office within the same forum as the public service was, um, was remarkable. So first time I, I, I think it's been done, that, that it's been formalized that they, those who are paid to be partisan uh, in the same room as those who are paid to be nonpartisan, but the imperative is um, so great. And I mean, everyone knows from around this table that it's not so binary that, you know, you've got advisors and you've got public servants and never the twain shall meet. Always the twain meets. It's just the grounds on which they meet. And here, we, it, it, it has proved to be remarkably efficient and effective in being able to generate good decisions in extraordinarily short, uh, extraordinarily short time frames. Mm. And, and maybe, you, I, mean, I, I did want to cover this particular topic and uh, so maybe we can sort of extend on this a little bit. I'm really interested in kind of um, how the relationship, you know, what, what happened to the relationship between, um, I guess, the sort of the, the political uh, class, the, you know, advisors, uh, ministers and, and uh, officials as a, as a result of that sort of closer working and collaboration? Uh, I think one of the things that this has, the crisis has shown to me is in so many respects, what, what it has done is exaggerated things. Um, it's exaggerated weaknesses, um, it's exaggerated strengths, it's compressed time frames. So what, what, what I, the conversion of that observation into 
the relationship between ministers and the public at the public service it's it, it there's always been a symbiosis um, where where it works well um, it, the definition of symbiosis being a mutually beneficial relationship so where government works well there is always a symbiotic relationship between the public service and uh, and political officers and the ministry um, but Fundamentally, in its essence, the, the relationship remains the same. Our obligation is to provide high quality and impartial advice and implement the decisions of government with speed and competence. Um, that hasn't changed, never changed, hasn't changed over the past two months. What it's done though, it's, it's emphasised the importance of that doing well because of the cadence and complexity of public administration over the past two months. And I think that, so I think the essence doesn't remain, doesn't change. The, the, the fundamentals remain the same. And similarly, as I said, that the, with ministers, officers and advisors, um, the different core drivers remain. Um, they're, you know, paid to be partisan, we're paid to be non-partisan. But the, there's the unparalleled level of collaboration driven by the imperatives of government which is to take good decisions in a short time frame means that some of the um, some of the you know the the tricks and the um, and the you know the games that we're all familiar with and you know we're all we've all navigated the the tricks and worked the games. There was just no time for it, mm. and everyone just that was, you know we're motivated by precisely the same purpose that. And, and, and it's not as though the operation of government over the past three months has been eight years. It's just, that's just fanciful. Um, and the politics of that to the people of Australia who are around this call have been apparent in some of the fairly obvious debate that's occurred at the, at the national level. It's just that it's been subordinated. It's been subordinated to the greater cause, um, to the more fundamental purpose of all of us, which is to maximise the effectiveness of the public health response and to ensure that we have a viable society and a viable economy while having proper regard to that. And I, my, my view is, and I think it's more than my view, it's been reflected in data that's emerged about the increase in the regard, trust and confidence that, um, that the, the, the population have in government, I think that's 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 apparent, mm -hmm. and and I think the um, the trick now is to not to go back to our corners and box on in an old in an old paradigm. Instead yeah. of taking taking advantage of the of this of the new the new paradigm, whether it's what are these new structures of government that might be enduring in a post crisis world. What are the service delivery innovations that we can build upon? Um, how can the public service work as effectively as it has worked in the inevitable environment where we will be more remote in the way that we connect with our workplace, inevitably? Um, these are all the, the, the super cool challenges that we've got because there will be no snapback in public administration, or if there is, we should be held account, held to account for enabling a snapback. I mean, this provides paralleled opportunity for public administration in Australia and hopefully globally to build upon the things that we've learned uh, and the purpose that we've, you know, commonly signed on to. So um, we're going to come on to sort of what we think might be some of the sort of future implications, but I will just um, uh, sort of bring in a comment that has put on the Q&A, um, which I think Janine wrote on Twitter, which just sort of touches on this issue of, um, you know, national cabinet, a, a national cabinet focused on a clear purpose like COVID may be quite different from one dealing with business as usual. How political leaders, public services and public servants work together or not in crisis versus non-crisis settings is very different. Uh, interested in our reflections on this. So I guess the question is, you know, it's obvious when, 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 when you know, it's a, it's a, you know, a moment of national importance and critical 
uh, moment that, that things get done, yeah. can, can we carry this, this kind of, this, this new collaborative spirit into um, what comes next? Yeah, look, it's, uh, I mean, I, the, the worst thing to do is to um, artificially perpetuate a crisis just because <laughs> the way you're operating now works, works, works more effectively during a crisis. A crisis. So I'm, I don't think the answer is let's invent the new crisis, um, <laughs> create, create a crisis. But it is a real, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a genuine dilemma. Um, the, the, the Prime Minister and the National Cabinet have created the next singular focus uh, last week, which is the creation of jobs. And that will become uh, that, and there's a whole lot of the paraphernalia of intergovernmental relations which will fall away in the pursuit of that singular focus. Um, and, and so I think that is a, a crisis of a different character mm. to the the crisis of the, the public health response. So let's project beyond that to, to, a, to a world where 850,000 Australians are back in employment and where, I mean, heaven, heaven knows when that'll be, but that is now the singular focus of the, of the National Cabinet. But I think the trick is, is, to, is to work out, diagnose, but what is it about the national cabinet that has been effective? And then to seek to take the lessons from that, that will work in a non-crisis environment. And a little bit of thoughtfulness about, uh, about what we have learned and the importation of that into a, a post-COVID normal world. Um, I, I think that th there's a few things that have come to my immediate um, my immediate mind around that. One is that there's a an operating principle for the national cabinet now, which I think is embedded in its opera. I hope it will become embedded in its operations, which is that the decisions of of the national decisions need to accommodate differences between jurisdictions a recognition that, that we as a federation are different. Uh, the North and the South and the East and the West are different. And the idea that, that the search for a national position based on a consensus leading to a lowest common denominator, which has been a criticism in the past of some of the operating method, is a thing of the past. Um, and so if, if you, if you accept, as I think we, we are beginning to accept, that, that if we move to an outcomes-based approach, where if we have common regard and common commitment to the relevant outcome that we're seeking to achieve, and outcomes are super cool because they offer clarity about the shared purpose and objectives, and they focus actually on what we want to achieve and the decisions and actions we want to, we want to create and the investments we want to make, but to allow for the fact that you can get to the outcome through different pathways and at a different time frame, and that that's not a bad thing. I think that will be a significant marker of the way the National Cabinet has evolved its operating, operating method. I think there's been something really interesting too about the transparency through the visibility and high engagement in the press conferences so it's the absence of, um, it, it's like the, uh, the, the opaqueness of COAG, where you would have this highly formalised response in the form of a negotiated communique, which was, you know, hard, hard, hard drafted and hard won. The, at the moment, what the public has been watching is the leaders coming out straight out of National Cabinet, accompanied by the expert decision makers who were providing input to the decisions and communicating directly with, the, with, with Australia. And it happened at both the national and at the state level. And I think- yeah, I've never seen so much of our chief medical officers as in the last few months. No, exactly. So I, I think the, so that this, the, the immediacy 
communication of decisions and the rationale for decisions to the to a, an inf, to an informed and interested public, I think will endure. Um, I think the idea of of things moving from input to decision quickly that will endure. So some some matters don't aren't amenable to that. I suspect that the matters that are amenable to that won't be considered by the national cabinet. Um, and what's been also really impressive is even though as a national cabinet, it has no, there's no, there's obviously no constitutional basis for it, but um, how, how, how is it what it is? I mean, you know, from first principles, I don't know, um, but I do know that it formally adheres to the most critical precepts of cabinet governance, which is confidentiality and solidarity based around collective decision making. So there have been no leaks out of the national cabinet. And so, again, for our internationals, we've got we've got we've got different um, colours, different parties um, between yeah. the states and and the sort of the national government. So it's not like they're all in all in the same the same political stripe, and yet they have managed this level of collegiality through this process. Yeah, and I think the final point, and I uh, around the national cabinet, that's something you touched on, Brent, was. The old COAG would meet once or twice a year. They've now committed because of the technology, which has never been used for COAG in the past. Each of the national cabinets has been through force of circumstance um, by telepresence. And it's that, it, it's pretty hard to, the, the, the intimacy and familiarity that comes with the frequency of engagement is really important. Now, during the crisis, that was twice weekly or even more frequently than that. What they have agreed to do for the remainder of the, the, the COVID, our COVID environment is to meet fortnightly. And then as a national cabinet in the post COVID normal world, it's to meet monthly. And so with a, an annual meeting face to face. So it's a bit harder to be rude to people if you are in their company constantly. You're gonna see them in two weeks time. Exactly, I'm, I'm gonna be rude to you now and then I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna come up and face the consequences of that in two weeks time. So I think that it's, it's bred a, um, a collegiality um, an intimacy, sure, driven by a crisis, 100%. Would we have ever got to this point organically and absent the crisis? No. Uh, they have the, our, our leaders have now determined that there is this that need to be not need to be but should be perpetuated. Yeah, um, someone had put it. Uh, sorry, and I should mention who it is. Uh, Fiona um, had asked a question. A bit of a sliding doors moment. Do we think we'd have the same rosy view of these governance arrangements had the uh, COVID numbers not been quite so healthy in this country, or might we sort of have descended to you know? Our, uh, has everyone got along because actually we've, you know, to some degree succeeded? Look, I mean, that's a... <laughs> it's a hypothetical. <laughs> it's a hypothetical and I think it's pretty, it, it, it's, a, it's useful to, to pause on it. Um, if it had all gone totally pear-shaped, as opposed to it being applauded globally, as uh, the poster, poster child of a successful response to the pandemic and therefore a degree of mutual congratulation around the table. Yeah. Um, well, I don't Would know. it have descended into blame games? <laughs> Maybe yeah, we'll just leave that I, one hanging. <laughs> well, I, I, let me, I'll take the, I'll take the Sunday upland and say that our political leaders would have risen to that particular challenge as effectively as they've risen to this particular challenge. I think. Very good. <laughs> um, there was also another question. Um, you, you talked about like let's not snap back. Um, how do we actually avoid just snapping back? And what role do people like yourselves and other sort of leaders of public services play in um, in that process? Um, well, I think that there's a couple of parts to that. One is. Uh, is to be quite clear about what it is that we want to endure. 
Well, not just assume that it's going to be a, you know, a, the self-evident proposition that everyone, um, everyone, you know, sort of intuitively buys into. So we have an obligation to codify what it is that we want to endure. And for me, for me, there's a few things that, you know, that even without proper reflection um, come to mind. One is the, the importance of tailoring, the res of tailoring responses to ensure government services meet individual, the individual needs of citizens. Self-evident proposition, but through the service delivery reforms, I think the absolute, the, the, the absolute imperative of ensuring that we have that alignment of government service with individual needs of citizens um, the second thing is what we're learning is the application of data in all its forms and in an integrated fashion and that that data is provided directly to decision makers rather than just assuming decision makers are you know, not interested or not capable of understanding primary data. I mean, we've done and compelled to bring together a minimum 15 data sets and the modelers and analysts associated with those independently held data sets to compile a picture for government of everything that's associated with, uh, um, with the pandemic. But we never want to go back to a place where the owners of data sit in different places from each other and sit in splendid isolation from decision makers. And the third, one of the other things for me is not to lose the concept of a mission as an organising principle for government. So for me, the, the way we don't snap back is to be quite forensic about what it is that we have learned and then what it is we want and then to, um, to pitch that back to government. And you don't do that at the end, you do that now. Mm -hmm. So we're introducing the concept of a, of a, quite, a quite structured formal of that um, formative evaluation of what we're doing. So we don't wait for a summative evaluation when maybe the train is moving to the next stop. Um, we want to we want to capture capture the lessons in real time, project out to what we want as a preferred future, and then to be quite specific about what are the elements of the structures of government or the service delivery innovations that we want to that we want to build that we want to either. You know, that we want to perpetuate or we want to build on because I mean it's it's interesting that some of the some of the the innovations that are in prospect are not are not ones that that have been instantly um, that, are, that are instantly obvious and ones where we're going to have to spend a bit of time on them so for example um, staggered school start times you can't just you know pull that out of a hat um, embedding a modal shift in transport, can't just pull that out of a hat. Um, the extension of the whole concept of, of home-based medical treatment, you can't just pull that out of a hat. So there's different, there are different ways in which you can position yourself. One is to be clear about the ultimate objective and the things you want to, you want to um, the preferred future at a, at a quite elevated level, then getting down into what are the service delivery reforms that we want to continue? Because there are some, it's quite, it'll be quite interesting, there are some vested interests who have conceded to the service delivery reform because of the immediacy of the need, mm -hmm. but they were interested in reverting back to a, a norm. Yeah. And we have to that happening. <laughs> we have to stop that happening. And then there's the idea of working out what are the longer run uh, reforms, capture them, and now start to develop the case for their, um, for their elaboration. Brilliant. Um, so obviously a big focus uh, for States of Change has been on sort of um, 
the sort of future skills needs of public servants. Um, and again, sort of, um, sort of reflecting on some of the skills that have been um, uh, by necessity sort of hastily um, assembled or strengthened. You mentioned data being one of them. Um, you, you know, looking ahead, you know, what, what, what from this period do you sort of want to see part of the enduring sort of, uh, uh, sort of skills toolkit that public servants take into the future? Yeah, it's, um, we're, and we've got to be really, really diligent around, um, around this and not just assume that we've all suddenly discovered new ways of work or we don't need any further support. Uh, at one level, what it's done is emphasised the, the importance and relevance of certain latent characteristics of public service operations and brought them to the fore. And so I think data falls into that category. Data has been so important to the effective response of, um, of, the, of the Federation and of the public service. But for those who, who were um, insouciant about the importance of data, pack that insouciance away. Um, data, data is king or queen. And uh, so I see that as now being prominent there's something too about um, the new service delivery models and the ability, the ability for the public service to become more expert in remote modes of service delivery and the ability to assist clients to adapt to and exploit new technologies. They're two different, two different skill sets. Um, I think that that will be important. Um, I think there's something about the, it's emphasised for me, the premium on systems thinking. Never before have I seen the requirement for um, an approach to analysis that focuses on the way that a system's constituent parts interrelate and how systems work over time and within the context of larger systems. Everything is connected to everything else and no more has that become apparent than the intimate interconnection between so much of what we may have been forgiven for thinking were, uh, were uh, not interdependent. I think behavioural economics is going to be critical. Um, the, 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 there's going to be a whole requirement to support, I think in the new world, a whole series of pro, new pro-social behaviours and the importance of of behavioural economics in looking at the psychological, cognitive, emotional, cultural and social factors and, and their impact on decisions and institutions is going to come, come to the fore. I think there's going to be a requirement, God help us all, um, for greater openness, transparency and accountability so all, dis, all citizens can see how decisions are made. I think they're not going to accept us going back to a a more that he's not going back into the bottle doing business yeah i just don't reckon that's gonna cut it and then there's going to be this really interesting thing about how do we manage work-life balance in a remote working context how do we how do we assist people with self-awareness and self-reliance because well, to be self-reliant, you need to be self-aware. Do we equip people, do we equip our people to enable them to make sense of, um, of a, new, a new way of working? And I reckon that from some survey work that we've done, so we've, we've got a, a public service for our, our friends in the state and overseas, a public service of about 50,000 in the public sector. So the sector picks up police, nurses, emergency services workers. The core public service is about 50,000. And we conducted a survey, 6,000 who've been, who usually work in, a, in a, an office environment and who are working remotely. And to try and find out, well, what the heck's going on? What's going on in their heads and in their hearts? And we found some some pretty interesting stuff, which we will need to um, 
in, in, as part of the, the investment in professional learning, professional development, psychological support, uh, and so on, prof professional training. Um, we found some really interesting data out of the 6,000 respondents. And I can be pretty confident that if at the moment we've, I've got 99% of my workforce of 1,100 is working remotely at the moment. Um, and only out of the, out of the entire 6,000, only 4% of the 6,000 don't want to have some form of extension of the remote working experience. But 15% are struggling. They want it, but they're struggling. And so we need to understand what it is they are struggling with. We've got a, a bit of an idea at the moment, but not not enough of an idea for us to be able to introduce the, the, um, the, a, a systematic response. But what we've found is that the, the vast majority have been able to do their jobs remotely. Um, overall, people are more productive and as engaged as before, but the ways of collaboration can be improved. They've actually found that, they, that they're as effective in, their, in the deliverables, but managing people is more difficult. So we need to, we need to help people managers with their ability to, to work with their teams and manage them remotely. And we put in a, a question about, uh, uh, I suppose it's a bit of a leading question, but they said most of them are thriving. The, the word is thrive, and it's largely due to the support and the flexibility to engage in work-life balance. So, therefore, the, by the, the end product of that is, I think we will work, we will come to a point where the overwhelming majority of people are working at least two to three days a week remotely. And that is a seismic shift. Yeah. Um, so, it's always very difficult because I knew we were going to have a nice, lovely, flowing conversation, but I am going to just pause us there for a second, um, largely because this is a 90-minute session and some people may need to just stretch, um, go get themselves a cup of tea. Uh, yes, yourself included. Um, and uh, just maybe think about what you've heard to this point. The last 30 minutes will be even more interactive. Um, so if you've got uh, comments you'd like to share in the chat, if you've got questions you'd like to ask in the Q&A, um, but we're just going to give ourselves two minutes. You're not going to miss anything. Go grab yourself a cup of tea, stretch, and then we'll kick up again. Is There we go. Right. Uh, good. We're back. You did a little dance. There we go. Um, so we've got some, uh, we've got some more questions uh, coming through. Um, first one. Do you see the efficiencies in governance filtering down through the departments and perpetuating naturally, or will this require leadership from Sylvie? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I, I would hope that the evidence is so apparent and so compelling that it will that people will pick this up without having to be drawn to it to directly. Uh, there's no, there's obviously no substitute for leadership uh, in all of this. In particular, being able to being able to pick out the the pieces that you you can observe from from being in a leadership position about all of the moving parts. But I go back to the point that I made earlier that some of the most profound innovations have come from frontline workers. And I mean, it, it's, it's a, you know, a bottom up, a top down approach. So I think I, I'm totally confident that, that the, the leadership will be, the leadership will be important from, particularly from the premier in mandating, in mandating the, the organisation of government might look like on, on the other side. But the leadership that's being exhibited at the team level and the individual worker level, that's, that's ignition, that's gone. Um, our responsibility as leaders is to keep pace with the innovation that's mm -hmm. being exhibited by the workforce. Um, 
And in some ways, it's just get out of the way and enable and put a bit of structure around it to, to support the, um, the distribution of those innovations more, more broadly. Well, that ties nicely into a question from Mark, um, which is maybe sort of just to push you a little bit on kind of what's probably the most radical innovation that you've seen during this period um, in sort of services. So rather than just digitizing like remote teaching via Zoom, but a, a chance to really innovate a service or process. Um, yeah. Um, it, it, everything is, is contextual uh, in the sense that radical is in the eyes of the beholder. So one of the more radical, um, if you look at conservative past practice, has been the use of audio visual links to enable court matters to be heard remotely. Now, for some, that might seem to be unremarkable, but for a profession that has been built and enculturated in a particular way, and I absolutely don't mean this as a pejorative, everything is about, everything is relative to your cultural start, starting point. For the courts to move to embracing that in a, you know, in a, a really wholehearted fashion actually represents a remarkably radical uh, intervention. So I use that as an example only because I'm, I'm, I'm not deeply familiar with 150 service delivery design innovations. I only make that point because everything is contextual. And yep. I think that the, that's an example of a, of a of a radical intervention for the context of the way justice has been conventionally administered. Yeah, um, it's interesting, uh, reflecting on the um, last few days in the UK, where they've managed to move a whole bunch of parliamentary business online, committee work, um, and voting. And now there's a, there's a desire to return to a socially distant but, but physical um, version of parliament with all of its um, uh, challenges. And um, yeah, it, yeah. Uh, it looks like a retrograde step for, for many people and myself included. Yeah, well, there was a, another in, uh, innovation that emerged by necessity, which the, uh, the local councils in Victoria were, were required to, to validly meet were required to meet in person. So we had to legislate to enable the third tier of government to operate in a in a remote or, or virtual sense. Now that again feels remark unremarkable because it's essentially bringing a tier of government up to almost pre-industrial, let alone industrial um, levels of you know connection. But nonetheless, for you know, it, it, it's it's a deeply a deeply profound reform about enabling a, a, a level of government to to meet and to legislate in a um, in a different form to that which has you know served us for centuries. Yeah. Um, question from Nicole: um, When you were drawing inspiration on how to redesign government, um, where did you get your inspiration from? Were you looking at specific examples or models, or were you drawing it up from first principles? No, there were. Oh, well, um, I was uh, a shameless plagiarist. So, I mean, I'm a, a total bowerbird. But if I, if there's a good idea, then I'll go and get the idea and bring it back to the nest. And <laughs> and if there's a bunch of people who are in the same room who are contributing to, you know, the gathering of the ideas. There is no template for this, uh, this yeah. model. It hasn't occurred anywhere else. And it certainly hasn't been assembled in, it's been assembled in Victoria. That's just a statement of fact. Um, I knew the limits of my capability around that, which was why on the Sunday I convened um, organised the, con the convening of really smart people from multi disciplines, not just the public service, but the political class, 
who um, and I just sort of shared a workshop. And, and then we progressively refined it uh, over the journey. So was it reference to first principles? I reckon, I reckon. Um, there were some first principles which were um, to, remain, to remain faithful to the fundamental precepts of the cabinet system of government, uh, that there needed to be um, the, the accountability of the executive to the parliament can't be, can't be ignored. Uh, I think there was some uh, a principle around, so a principle around maintaining the fundamentals of good public governance, um, so that you have strong, ins strong institutions, mechanisms to support decision making is a, is a first principle. Um, and I reckon there was something to write in as a design principle of our responsibility of public servants to be the guardians of public trust and to build it with the community. So everything we do should be referenced to supporting as a social foundation the relationship between those who govern and those who are governed. So, and that's not being overly lofty. You just need to constantly reference your design back to really, really core, um, core uh, drivers of our vocation. And to be honest, the, 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 and this sounds almost, almost twee, it is about the, the core principle about contributing to um, a better society through the drive to create and deliver value for, uh, deliver value for the public. So I always figure that the best way of designing something is to go back to bedrock and then to start to build from the bedrock to create the edifice and the architecture. And in all of this, going back to your bedrock, I think is really important and to keep testing what you're doing to, against your bedrock. And then what is your decision-making process? Well, the, the cabinet system is pretty hard to beat. When you think about it, the cabinet, we're having to build into our, you know, into the, the warp speed of our decision making, the fact that good decisions are made on the basis of people having the ability to make a, a, a meaningful contribution to the, the subject of, of the decision, uh, for there to be a genuine contest around whatever it is that's being decided, that options are being presented to enable views to be framed and formed and debated, all of that within a ridiculous time frame. Um, so I think that you have to you have to keep coming back to what has, what supports good decision making and then not to lose sight of that totally in your design, but to modify it for the cadence that you're having to you're having to having to work. Yeah. So we've, we seem, we appear to have flattened one curve, but we have another curve that we have uh, maybe been less um, able to, to flatten, namely around um, sort of uh, our sort of carbon footprint uh, in this country. I, I, I'm wondering if you've got any reflections about what we've learned from this um, moment and the sort of the governance innovations we've spent the last hour talking about that might stand us in good stead for the, the next curve, the, the carbon curve that we need, to, we need to flatten. If we don't have, um, if we don't have a consensus that there is um, an outcome based on a, a moral purpose, then we're doomed. You need to, there needs to be an acceptance that an outcome of a, um, a, an economy and a society where 
that has been decarbonised. And that is more than just um, more than just a, a rational economic response. It is a response that is connected to the moral purpose about creating a better society, which is deeply referenced to our obligation to pass on to future generations a better position than we find ourselves in. Mm-hmm. If we don't start from that as a, an organising principle, then we're doomed. Once you accept that, then there are multiple pathways to, um, to that, that outcome. I, my partner um, worked for the Australian Conservation Foundation as a climate change and energy campaigner. If you were to ask that question of her, she would have a, a, a very aggressive view about the pathway um, and I hope she's not listening, but that's that particularly aggressive view and it is pursued with, <laughs> with vigour is probably not going to be able to capture everyone who needs to be captured to support uh, the achievement of the outcome. But without the outcome, I'm not, in, I'm not sure that we can galvanise ourselves as a, as a society and a public service to, um, you know, to support the, the multiple pathways to that destination. It's been interesting, hasn't it? I mean, you, you sort of almost, if you think about that court example, there, there are lots of things that we think we can't do until we need to do them. And then after we've done them, we, we, look, at, we look back and say, well, actually, we, we could do this all along. Um, I'm just, I'm very interested about um, what's shifted in both um, as the speed of decision making, the collaboration between jurisdictions, but also expectations within the public about what is achievable. We talked at the start about, you know, the, the level of social control that the public ultimately were willing to accept because there was a strong enough uh, justification rationale for it. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious as to whether you think there's anything there that we can take forward into this this next curve battle um, about bringing the public along with the science. You know, we've talked about the role of expertise being brought into into the conversation and the raw data. Um, is there a different conversation we can be having in Australia around this? If we don't, if we don't learn from from the the last three months and export that learning to the existential challenge of climate change, then I think that's we will have done a, a, a disservice to the things that have motivated us and bound us over the past uh, over the past three months people will fundamentally disagree with that and it's a personal rather than a professional observation but we have demonstrated that we can be organized and we can apply we can apply all of our expertise uh, to a an existential challenge. Um, it'd be fantastic if we were to then pivot to that as the next existential challenge and to bring a lot of what we have learned to bear. Again, a, it's a very personal observation and not one that not one that's shared by by everyone. Sure. Um, could could the national cabinet infrastructure be um could that be an effective part of the response you have to have you have to have a singular purpose owned by all the participants uh, because otherwise you end up debating the purpose the singular purpose needs to be owned by all for the National Cabinet to be effective. And at the moment, a singular purpose that's referenced to the creation of 
jobs Oops, yeah. is, 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 is enough of a challenge for it to be um, the forum for the debate around the nature of the outcome, I think would be um, unproductive and would ultimately not a particularly useful way of focusing the, the future of the National Cabinet. Um, and that, again, is not to dumb it down. It's just effectiveness has been driven by the unanimity of, of, um, of purpose or connection to the purpose. And that will happen around the idea of the reaction of, of jobs because, you know, that the whole thing about... Um, and, and decent jobs... You know, the, the, the importance of employment for, for so many different parts of our well-being, not just, not just the obvious and immediate. So I, I, I think, Brenton, it would be best to, for the, for the moment, um, mm -hmm. for the, the Cabinet to be focused on something which, around which there is no disagreement about it as a, um, as a, as a, as a national imperative. Yeah. Um, we're nearly out of time. I'll ask one more from, from the audience, from Rach. She says, um, what compromises do we tolerate in a crisis that we need to guard against on the other side? Yeah. Uh, look, I think the single biggest compromise um, that we need to guard against is that the involvement of the citizenry in the development of the policy prescriptions now, the reality is that, that, that good policy is based on good process and good process has as part of it the iterative engagement and the deep socialisation of policy prescriptions with the public. And what has been necessarily lost, not lost, um, necessarily put to one side because of the, the requirement to move with the speed we've moved, is the deep engagement and iterative engagement with the citizenry of the options in relation to particular you know, policy outcomes. And that is to me the single biggest um, challenge is to, uh, is to adapt the process that is associated with good policy to a time frame that is compressed. Deliberative decision making is, I hope it's not a luxury. I hope it's a, I hope we can move to a point. I mean, if you go back to, you know, one of the signature policy reforms, the, the, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, muscular advocacy, moral purpose, productivity commission, um, expertise applied, bipartisan support, iterative development through engagement with those who were most affected. And it took a long time, but ultimately it yielded a, the most profound change since Medicare. You can't do that in a week. <laughs> no. And, and so, Somehow we need to capture the strengths of, um, of community engagement with policy and program design and to, and to bring it not in the, the, the cadence of the current decision making, but within a, I think the, the tolerance of the political class and the community for more rapid decision making means we're going to have to get a, we're going to have to box a little clever about how we how we blend the two. Mm -hmm. um, look, I think that um, that feels like a really nice uh, point to 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 end on. Um, look, we said at the start that this was a little bit of your own uh, moment for a bit of an on the couch session, a chance to process. Um, what's been going on in your life? I hope that's been helpful for you, Chris. I, look, I feel I feel liberated and fully. I mean that 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 was one of the most awesome therapy sessions, Breton, that I've engaged in such a public fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent.
<laughs> well, look, um, we really, really appreciate your time, um, Chris. Uh, thanks everyone for, for sticking uh, with us for the whole 90 minutes uh, for your questions. Um, hope to see you at another session soon. We do have a session on mission-oriented innovation. Unfortunately, it's a sellout, um, but um, do check our website for lots of other events over the next three weeks. And in the meantime, stay safe and well. And thanks again, Chris. Speak soon. My pleasure. Thank you.